You may think the Earth is pretty big, but the Sun makes up almost 99.9% .9 of the mass of the whole solar system. The rest of the mass is made up by the planets and their satellites, asteroids, comets, gas, and dust. It's around 93 million miles away from our planet, but it keeps us warm every day. Its temperature is about 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit, but the space surrounding it is still cold as ice. To understand this, we need to distinguish between heat and temperature. Heat is the energy inside some object. Temperature is something that tells us if that object is hot or cold. When the heat is transferred to that object, it makes its temperature go up. When the object is losing heat, the temperature goes down. Heat can be transferred in three different ways. The sun does it through radiation. That means it's releasing heat in the form of light. Your body radiates heat too as infrared waves. That's why thermal imaging cameras will detect that you're in the room even at night. The hotter the object, the more heat it will radiate. The temperature only affects matter. Since space is mostly a vacuum, it doesn't have enough particles for heat to transfer in any other way than through radiation. When the heat from the sun gets to an object, the atoms start absorbing energy, but the heat can't transfer since there's no matter in space those rare atoms and molecules in space will absorb the heat. And they'll simply stay that way, while the cold vacuum will stay cold. There's a lot of matter inside Earth's atmosphere, so the energy of the sun can transfer easily. But if you put an object outside of the Earth's atmosphere in direct sunlight, it would end up heated to 250 degrees Fahrenheit because it's matter made of atoms and molecules. The temperature of the vacuum is negative 454 degrees Fahrenheit. That means, depending on where you are, space can either burn or freeze you. The sun isn't actually yellow. It emits light over a wide range of wavelengths. We can tell both its temperature and color by the peak in its spectrum. For instance, cooler stars will appear red, and hotter stars will be blue with yellow, orange, and white stars in between. When it comes to the sun, the spectrum peaks at a wavelength we'd usually call green, but our eye perceives it differently. So, the shade of green in combination with other wavelengths from the spectrum is going to look white to the human eye. We generally see the sun as yellow because our atmosphere scatters blue light more efficiently than the red one. During sunrise and sunset, there's more red light in the spectrum of the sun, which gives us amazing sceneries. Sunspots are part of the sun's visible surface that are on average way cooler than the sun itself. They overlap with parts that have an increased magnetic field. These parts don't allow the release of heat to the sun's visible surface. That way, the rest of the sun's surface is three times brighter than those sunspots. That contrast makes them appear almost black. If we could take a sunspot apart from the sun and place it somewhere in the night sky, it would be different as bright as the moon when we see it from the Earth. All the planets in our solar system spin in the same direction because they were formed from one protoplanetary cloud, except for Uranus and Venus. They have probably had some strong impact on them that made them spin in the opposite direction. But it's different with galaxies. They don't usually form the same cloud of dust and particles. Also, they're not randomly distributed across space. They come in filaments, dense, slender strands of dark matter and galaxies, with voids in between. Proto-galaxies are linked by gravitational forces in small areas of space. This is probably because of the distribution of dark matter throughout the universe. The matter in the filaments moves in a corkscrew motion and goes towards the densest area. So, there might be a common direction galaxies tend to spin, but it's mostly random. There's a possibility we'll see a lunar elevator one day. Yep, a cable anchored to the surface of the moon. It would stretch 250,000 miles. We wouldn't be able to directly attach it to our planet because both Earth and the moon are moving. But we could keep it terminated high in our planet's orbit. Some researchers believe we could build such an elevator for a few billion dollars. The moon has resources we could definitely use. A rare form of helium found there could be of use in fusion power stations on our planet. 
Also, we could take some other rare elements and use them in smartphones and the rest of electronics. So, after around 53 trips up and down, the elevator could pay for itself. The cable would be as thick as a pencil, but its weight would be around 40 tons. It could even be made of materials we already have here on Earth with no need to invent something. There could even be a combination of two elevators. A spacecraft would winch up an elevator from the surface of our planet to a space station. Then it would be flung towards the moon. There would be another elevator to finally lower it down to the surface of the moon. Planets in our solar system have predictable and stable orbits. But gas giant collisions could have happened at an early stage when a planetary system was still forming. In case of a head-on collision, two gas giants would merge. They wouldn't end up losing their mass, the materials in their gaseous envelopes, or the ones in their solid cores. Such a collision at a higher speed would cause the loss of the major part of the envelope gas, and very high speeds, boom, both planets are gone. It's different if it's not a head-on collision. If two cores manage to completely avoid each other, gas giants won't merge, but they'll lose some of the mass. Gas giants might even change their shape due to such collisions. Astronomers found out there's a galaxy extremely far away from us that looks similar to our Milky Way. We now see it as it was when the universe was only 1.4 billion years old, and now it's 13.8 billion years old. It took over 12 billion years for the light to come from this faraway galaxy and reach our planet. This galaxy is peaceful, stable, and surprisingly non-chaotic, unlike all other galaxies that were quite turbulent in their early stages. To leave the Milky Way, we'd have to travel around 25,000 light-years away from the center of the galaxy, or 500 light-years vertically. Our galaxy is a disk of stars that spreads around 100,000 light-years across and is 1,000 light-years thick. The Sun, its central star, is located halfway from the center of the galaxy and close to the middle of the disk in the vertical direction. We'd have to go further than its edge to get away from the halo that surrounds the Milky Way, old stars, diffuse gas, and globular clusters. If you wanted to go even further to see the Milky Way in all its glory, you'd have to travel 48,000 light years vertically. At this moment, we don't even have a telescope we can send there. There are central stars that eat planets. Our solar system is stable, unlike many other planetary systems. So we don't have to be afraid the Earth or some other planet will change its orbit and go towards the Sun. But at least a quarter of other planetary systems with orbiting stars similar to the Sun have a pretty chaotic past. In some of them, there are planets that used to move around, and their unpredictable migrations have disrupted the paths of some other planets or even pushed them outside of their orbit. That means some planets probably have fallen into the central star. When that happens, the planet gets dissolved in the outer layer of the star, which means it gets eaten.